All right. I want to talk today about God's gift of elderly Christians. Okay. And uh, question: Who was the oldest person? I'll be politically correct. Who was the oldest person that ever lived? Methuselah. Methuselah. Correct. How old was he? I don't remember. Three hundred and forty something. Uh. It was nine hundred. So it was, uh, it was over nine hundred. Yeah, over nine hundred years. Was it nine thirty-seven? Nine sixty-nine. Nine hundred sixty. Nine hundred sixty-nine years old. But. Uh, that's not what the secular world thinks. According to, uh, I'll call it Wikipedia, <laughs> the oldest person that ever lived is a woman named Jean Calment. She was born 21st of February 1875, and she lived till the 4th of August 1997. She was 122 years old and 165 days. Uh, she was lived in France. And uh, they say on their website, this is a list of tables of the verified oldest people in the world in ordin ordinal rank, such as oldest person or oldest man. In these tables, a supercentenarian is considered verified if his or her claim has been uh, validated by an international body that sp specifically deals in longevity research, such as the... And then they list two different things there, and one of which is Guinness World Records. Now... What are they actually saying with that? That the Bible's false. That the Bible's false. This is not a verified document, in other words. You know, a woman that's 122 and a half years old is nothing compared to the way they lived back before the flood. Okay? Uh, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read about Methuselah. And I figured this would be a good place to go to, since we're going to be talking about elderly Christians, I want to talk about the oldest men in the Bible. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. This is the greatest book that's ever been written, and the fact that the secular world denies the truthfulness of it, it's because, you see, there's something out there called evolution philosophy. Evolution philosophy teaches that men were inferior in the past and that they're getting better and better. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the exact opposite. Men were superior in the past and were getting less and less. <laughs> Alright? And the Bible talks in First Timothy chapter 6, I think it's verse 20, it talks about uh, beware of oppositions of science falsely so called. That's what evolution is. It's a philosophy. It's a religious philosophy. It's not science. But anyhow, let's read here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. Uh, and all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now we've been over that before here at Bible Believers Fellowship, that people say there is no rapture. There's no rapture in the Bible. Right there's a rapture. Before God's wrath came in the flood, God took somebody up. Back in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that he was translated. Okay? Why? Well, because he had a testimony that he pleased God. He walked with God for 300 years. That's why God took him. Not going to go into all that right now, but continuing here. Verse 25. And Methuselah, Methuselah lived an hundred eighty and seven years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah, Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech seven hundred eighty and two years and begat sons and daughters. Now here we go, verse 27. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred sixty and nine years and he died. Nine hundred sixty nine years. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think Methuselah was some ignorant caveman that sat around you know, grunting and pounding rocks together for 969 years? No. How much could you learn in 969 years? <laughs> Quite a bit. You know, pretty amazing. Uh, and it's interesting there, verse 25, Methuselah lived in 180 and 7 years and begat Lamech. And usually when they would begat a son, that would be the first one. They wouldn't wait to say, you know, well, he had a whole bunch of sons and daughters, and then he had Lamech. 
you know, he had a, a, kids after that. Verse 26 talks about begat sons and daughters. You know, he lived a long time after that. But 187 years old before he had his first son. That's pretty incredible. You got to wonder how many years he spent in school. <laughs> You know, probably like the first hundred years, you know, you know, you spend the first hundred years in school or traveling the earth or something, you know, and, and then, you know, 87 years later you get, you know, or, you're, you know, we'll say 60 years you get uh, engaged and then you stay engaged for 20 years and <laughs> it's amazing. You think of what these people would have known back then, you know, I don't think I would have wanted to go back in time because they'd probably be like little idiot kid here or something you know they'd probably probably consider us to be pretty stupid the way we are right now but 969 years that's a long time that's what the bible says pretty incredible now look at verse 28 we're going to see here about lamech and lamech lived in 180 and two years and begat a son and he called his name noah did you ever hear of noah saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat uh, Noah five hundred ninety and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred seventy and seven years. Hmm, interesting. And he died. Verse 32, And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Very interesting there. But I want you to see a few things. First of all, and we've talked about this in other studies, Enoch lived for 365 years, which is it was is the exact number of days in a Gentile calendar. I think the Jewish calendar is 360 days. So that's kind of an interesting thing, that he lived for exactly 365 years. He was translated that he should not see death. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Now this one, you know, I, I couldn't make a real big thing on this, but 969 years, if you flip the two nines over, you'd have 666. I don't know about if there's really anything there, but it's interesting that Lamech there, how long did he live? 777 years. 777. Isn't that interesting? The time of Jacob's trouble, there's a very distinct 777 in that. You got the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. And it says about as in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. Now there's probably something there. I, you know, I'm just not smart enough to figure it out. I went over it a couple times and I was trying to tie things together and it's like the Lord has a way of revealing things before they happen. Oftentimes thousands of years before they happen. There were many prophecies about Jesus Christ his first coming, that were prophesied hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up. And there are things prophesied about Jesus' second coming. And there's a lot of that stuff in here, and a lot of it, some of it I understand, a lot of it I don't. And I, like I said, I was going through it, and I thought, man, there's probably something to this. But, I don't know, just kind of an interesting thing. Now, I want to show you something else here that's kind of interesting. I have here Creation Science Evangelism. This is back in the old days. <laughs> Not to be confused with the new Creation Science Evangelism, the one that exists since Ken Hoven is now in prison. I don't support the new one. But uh, this is the old one. And if you see here this chart, Adam lived for 930 years. He's up here, obviously, at the top. And then you have way down there, you have Lamech, the father of Noah, and Adam would have been old enough to know Lamech. That's pretty incredible. I mean, do you think Lamech might have been able to learn a little bit from his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather? Yeah, pretty amazing. And it's interesting, too, because if you look at the chart, Noah lived long enough to know Abraham. Noah lived for hundreds of years after the flood. It wasn't that the flood ended and then Noah died shortly thereafter. Uh-uh. He lived for hundreds of years. Many, many hundreds of years. Um, so what can you learn from that? 
you can learn that these guys were incredibly intelligent. And where did a lot of their intelligence come from? Well, of the Lord, yeah, obviously that's the source of all intelligence and wisdom and understanding. But where did a lot of their learning come from, I should say? It came from the older people. See? You could learn a lot from a guy that lived before the flood and then lived after the flood. Noah lived for uh, 448 years after the flood. That's a long time. You could learn a few things from a guy like that. Now, what does the Bible say about elderly people? Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. I want to see a couple different things here. Okay, Leviticus 19, verse 32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. Well, you say, well, what's a hoary head? What on earth does that mean? Turn to the book of Job. We're going to see how the Bible defines itself. We have people here, of course, that know what the, the word hoary means. But we're going to go... You don't really need a lot of dictionaries and things like that. You can actually just look up, do word studies, and the Bible will often define words for you. This book is an incredible book. Job chapter 38, and we're going to look at verse 29. Job 38, verse 29. It says here, Out of whose womb came the ice, and the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? Now, what would hoary frost from heaven be? Snow. Do you ever hear somebody say that in an older person, they say, boy, he has hair as white as snow? So your Bible defines what the word hoary means. It means gray or like white, basically. And so the hoary head is a type of an older person. When you get older, your hair turns gray or white. Okay, that's, that's the way it is. And it's said there that you're to rise up before the hoary head. Now you can say that means a lot of things, but I, but I would say the practical application is if you're sitting sitting down someplace and an older person walks in, like if you're on the bus or something, get up out of your seat and give that older person a, that chair that you were sitting in. Okay, they have lived a long time on the earth. They have a right, and you know you have the duty to give them your seat. You should respect, you should show respect for that elderly person. Give them the chair that you have. All right, Show respect for them is what the Bible's trying to teach there. And you're to honor the face of the old man, said there in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. You are to respect the elderly. And I'm going to tie this together here towards the end of the message. You're going to see why I'm saying this. Uh, turn next to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 31. Proverbs 16, verse 31. It says here, The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. There you have another one of your Bible ifs. A lot of times you have things, I've made mention of this before, but you have something mentioned, and then the Lord says, if, you know, it be found in the way of righteousness. There are older people who have gray hair that you still should honor them, you still should have respect for them, but they really haven't come to that point of growing old in the way of righteousness. There are a lot of older men out there that are very wicked, very evil. You should still be respectful to them, but it's not quite the same. They, it's not a crown of glory for them. You know, it's not found in the way of righteousness. But you see that thing there. Again, we're going to tie into this scripture in just a little bit. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29. Proverbs 20, verse 29. 
says here, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is the gray head. You know, it's, I remember seeing the one time I was driving along and there was this old guy, he was out walking along the road, he had a cane, you know, and, and I looked at that guy and, uh, just something about him. He had, uh, he had like some tattoos on his arms, you know, you really couldn't tell what they were anymore, <laughs> but you know, you could tell that he just, he looked, some of the tattoos he had were like military types of things. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I thought to myself, you know, I bet that guy was a soldier. And I bet you he was a tough man back in his day. You know, his strength was his glory at one point in time. And now he's a older man, you know, just kind of an interesting thing that when you're young, you think to yourself, you know, man, look at me, I'm strong and everything. Well, if the Lord spares your life, you're going to live and be an old man someday. You know, your your youth and your strength are not permanent. But the point I want to make here, and I'm probably not going to make too many friends with this statement, but uh, that's okay, I'm kind of used to that. The beauty of old men is the gray head. Don't dye your hair. You know, I'm starting to actually get gray hair, you know. I'm getting a lot down here in my beard. Probably another couple of years if the Lord doesn't return, I'm probably going to have a gray beard. You think I'm going to dye it? Yeah. No. Not going to happen, you know. When I get gray hair, I'm going to have gray hair. I'm not going to dye my hair. Amen. You know, and it's kind of interesting because I've heard stories. We knew a, a family when I was young. We knew this family that they were missionaries. Was it to the Philippines? Uh, that, yeah, it was in the Philippines, you know, and over there in the Orient, uh, uh, older people with gray hair are honored. I know in Vietnam, they actually worship the older people. They'll actually build a, like a special little hut where they'll put their grandmother or something and then they wait on the people basically worship the grandparents. Now that's, you know, foolish. It's it's a pagan thing, as far as worshiping an older person. But there's that respect there for the elderly. And a lot of these countries, if you go to them and you have gray hair, you know, there was a, the one story that they were in the airport or at a train station or something. Airport was it? Yeah. And they went in there with gray hair. These missionaries and the people. Oh, you know, you go ahead, go ahead. You know, you go first. They showed great respect. For these people because of the gray head and like i said i'm probably not going to make many friends with this but the i think one of the i don't want to be too insulting here but one of the things that i think is looks very foolish a lot of times is when you see somebody who's obviously very old and they have very dark hair i mean i, I saw i remember seeing this one guy the one time i was at a grocery store and i saw this older guy walking out and he's just barely shuffling along you know i mean he was probably looked to be probably in his late 80s and he had blonde hair and he was dressed like a teenager baggy pants baggy shirt like these uh skater type sneakers on <laughs> i thought wow you know he almost kind of fooled me there you know when you get gray hair it's, it should be a sign of honor. Don't let the, the popular society say that, you know, youth, we need to worship the youth. That's foolish. That's very foolish. Gray hair should not be a dishonorable thing. All right? Okay, now, Proverbs chapter 4. We'll turn back there. Can you receive wisdom from the elderly? Proverbs chapter 4. Obviously, the answer to that question I just asked is yes. You can receive quite a bit of wisdom from the elderly. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and intend to know understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart Retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not. 
Who's the her? Wisdom. wisdom. All through the book of Proverbs, you'll see this thing about wisdom, and it's referred to as her. Okay? Uh, continuing here. Forsake her not, and she shall pre preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Now look at this, verse 9. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. What did we read earlier there in uh, Proverbs 16, verse 31? The gray head is likened to a crown of glory. Right there you see it again, verse 9. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. If you're wise, wise, you will live to an old age. And we're going to see here in just a little bit about how to attain long life. All right, but that's, that's an interesting thing there. I mean, he learned from his father. And you can learn a lot from your parents. And of course, from your grandparents, you can learn even more. Uh, just want to read a couple of things here quickly from a local newspaper. A couple of articles here, just a just as an example of some things, some older people that you could learn from. Um, a lot of these elderly people, a lot of them are, you know, they're they passed away now. But some of the people that went that lived back in the Great Depression years and World War II years and lived up through then, there's a lot of things that you could learn from them. Uh, this guy here is reading about this guy in a local paper. Not going to read his name, but uh, his last name's Groff. And uh, it says here, in his teen years, he worked as a laborer on several neighboring farms. He then worked for the railroad lines, helping to upgrade the railroad tracks to accommodate the heavier rail traffic through the north central region of Pennsylvania. He joined the 82nd Airborne at the start of World War II and was assigned to the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, Company E. He was part of the D-Day invasion, jumping behind enemy lines shortly after 0230 on June 6, 1944. After 14 days of battle, he suffered a severe head wound requiring hospitalization. On December 26, 1944, uh, he again jumped behind enemy lines with the 507th PIR during the Ardennes campaign, Ardennes campaign, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, commonly referred to as the Battle of the Bulge, Responsible to destroy a key bridge. Boy, I bet he'd have a few stories. Yeah. A man like that. You know? Well, I'd rather, you know, hear movies and stuff, pretend things from TV. Uh-uh. That guy right there had a more exciting life than anything you're going to see on TV. A lot of neat experiences. Uh, here's another one. Um, this woman here was, uh, she's a saved woman. She actually spoke... Uh, at Prophecy Club, which there's a lot about that organization I don't agree with, but uh, this woman here, Mrs. Kitty Web Worthman, uh, will help you see we are walking the same path as the Nazis. She was 12 years old living in Austria. At that time, there was order, prayer, and pictures of Jesus. Hitler took over, and all that was removed. Unemployment rose to 35%. Bank loans rose to 25%. Unions called strikes. All this was 98% of the people claiming to be Catholic. Soon there was a massive welfare. Cries went out for equal rights for women. Socialism took women out of the home, raising the children and into the factories. They took the children away from the family and raised them by the state. The health department offered training for the elderly, but they were killed. Propaganda showed children playing with guns, which caused gun registration causing guns to be turned in. Those refusing were killed. All radio stations were taken over by the government. Hear her tell how the U.S. is going the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that something? Now, let me ask a question. What would it take for her to have those experiences? Long life. Can you learn from the elderly? Absolutely. You could learn a lot from that woman. I'm going to skip that one for now. But uh, this is an interesting one here. 
Levi Cap. This is back in 2005. I don't know. He m might have passed away by then, by now. But uh, 107 year old county and looks back on a sensible life. 107 years old. That's pretty good age for now. You know, back before the flood, he would have just been a child. Pretty amazing. But it says here, Levi Cap turning 107 today remembers a time before licenses were required to drive, and William McKinley's first term as president. Cap, born on a farm between Indian Town Gap and Man Manata Gap, is Lancaster County's second oldest resident. The oldest is a woman at Fairmont Homes Retirement C Community in Ephrata. And uh, it says here, Cap, a resident of... Well, I won't bother with that, but it says uh, here, it's his quote, he says, I just led a sensible life, he said. I was a Christian all my life. I believed in the Lord and worked hard. Now, you know, obviously, I think if you talk to the guy, you know, he would say, yeah, I got saved, you know, but he was a Christian for the majority of his life there, not all of his life. Nobody's a Christian all of their life. But um, it just goes on to the things that he, different things that he did and uh, how he worked. And it's interesting, he actually drove, he was a chauffeur for Milton Hershey, guy who founded Hershey Chocolate Factory, the whole thing up there. But uh, he never graduated, never graduated high school, just worked hard all of his life, and uh, just lived a sensible life. Pretty amazing. Again, you could learn a lot from a guy like that. One more here, and then we'll continue with the message. This is one that's just recent. This was September 5th, I'm sorry, 3rd, 2011. And here you have this, this woman here. She's 90 years old, and she works 80 hours a week. Isn't that incredible? And uh, just kind of hit something here, highlight. Gotta find it here. And uh, this is kind of an interesting thing here. It says, she said that she dearly misses her 16 brothers and sisters, all of whom she outlived. <laughs> 16 brothers and sisters. That's a big family. Pretty amazing. Uh, it says here, despite her positivity, Ulrich isn't entirely pleased with what she sees. She comes from a more conservative age, and much of modern fashion doesn't jibe with her sense of style. Why do you have to show your body for attention, she said, lamenting the immodesty that she s said she sees in preteen girls all the way to their mothers. Today, anything goes. Hmm. And then another thing here, it says, on a grander scale, Ulrich bemoaned the trend of financial irresponsibility associated with credit card use. She came from a time when there weren't any credit cards, and she sees what it does to people. Uh, and she says here, another interesting thing, my son thinks this is terrible, but when I was young, we got an orange and candy every year for Christmas. We didn't know anybody yeah. any better. We were satisfied, she says pretty incredible can you learn a lot from the elderly you better believe it they are literally a lot of these elderly people are like a treasure trove of information and understanding and you're going to see why i'm saying this as we continue okay now first timothy chapter five we're going to turn there what about we've been back in the old testament the whole time here what about new testament instruction of uh, how Christians today should treat the elderly. This is going to be getting to the heart of the message here. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers, though younger as sisters, with all purity. Okay, now the term elder there can can oftentimes refer to a like a a man in in minute, like a pastor, a bishop, whatever. But in context here, it talks about the elder men and the elder women. Does it say that you treat the elder men as father as brothers? No, it says you treat them as fathers. And the elder women, it doesn't say treat them as a sister, treat them as a mother. Why? Because they have more experience. 
And there should be a great place of honor for the elderly in a church. That's something that's very, very important. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. It says here, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise. Just because you're to, to respect and honor the elderly, it doesn't mean that the elderly can just do whatever they want. There's still a very um, important role for the elderly to play, and there are some rules that the Lord lays out for the elderly. They're to be sober, you're to act your age. Don't if you're older, don't act like a teenager. Grave means you're to be serious. You know, I've, I've always been. There's always been something about when I see an older person trying to act like a teenager and they act goofy. I lose a lot of respect for them. They're to be more serious. Okay, doesn't mean they can't laugh. Doesn't mean they can't joke around. But there should be some seriousness there. Temperate. You better learn to be temperate. You know, don't do too much of something. Don't do too little. I mean, you, you should do all things in moderation. Sound in faith. Now, in logging, there's a, a term there for trees. They say, is, it, is, the, is the tree sound? You know what sound means? It means solid. A tree that's rotted out in the middle is not sound. And... That's the word here. It's a good description of it. You have somebody that doesn't know any doctrine, doesn't know any Bible. They're not sound in faith. But you have an older person that's been saved for 40, 50, 60 years, and they know the book, and they've been in the book, and they've gone through a lot of struggles and everything. They should be sound in faith. And they should be there to teach the younger. They should be there to say, I went through that same thing 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Here's how you get through it. Let me tell you, it'll be all right. It'll work out. That's a great treasure to have somebody like that, to have an older person there to reassure you that the Bible's true. In charity, they should have exercised charity all throughout their lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In patience. You're going to have to learn to be patient if you want to get, if you live a long time here on this earth. But continuing here, it says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to be sober, excuse me, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. If you are an elderly Christian, you have a very important job, and it's to teach the younger. Okay? Now, what happens when you have a church system that pushes the elderly Christians away? Is that a church system that God can bless? No. Uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I'm kind of jumping ahead, but we're going to turn next to Ephesians chapter 6. Back a couple books to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. And we're going to see here about a, a very real blessing uh, that will come to you if you do honor the elderly. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. It says here, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. There's a promise attached to this commandment. It says here that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. You know what the secret to living long, to becoming an elderly Christian yourself is? You're to honor the elderly. Honor your father and mother, but that extends. Remember what we read there in 1 Timothy chapter 5? That the older Christians, you're to, you're to entreat them as a father and as a mother. There's that thing there. So you can have fathers and mothers within the church. Okay, that might not be your actual fleshly father and mother, but the point is you're still to honor them so that you live long yourself. 
Uh, the commandment number five there is what that's referring to. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, we won't turn to there, but it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Very important portion of Scripture. Now, as I made mention earlier, we're going to turn back to the Old Testament now. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Verse 22 is where we're going to go. But as I made mention earlier, this modern church system is now very dishonorable to elderly Christians. And I'm going to talk more about that as we continue here. All right, here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. We're going to re read about an older man and about how his sons reacted to what he was trying to teach him. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 says, Now Eli was very old, and heard all that his sons did unto Israel, unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, now look at this, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Their father tried to instruct them. Eli tried to te teach his sons that were sinning. He tried to teach them the truth, and they didn't want to hear it. And because of that, the Lord said, Okay, I'm going to get rid of you. Okay, verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever, and now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. This family, back in, in the Old Testament, it was a very serious thing, the thing of families, okay? They would say, oh, you're of the house of uh, Eli. You know, you're, you're, this is your family. It was, a, it was a very serious thing. It wasn't just like, well, you know, yeah, my family's kind of corrupt, but I'm okay. You know, when your family was corrupt, the whole house was looked down upon. And the Lord said here, basically you have this, this priest of God coming and he's saying, you guys are in sin, and the Lord's going to have to do something to stop you. You know, you're not taking care of your sons. They're not wise. They're not listening to you as their older father. So the Lord's going to have to step in here and do something. And it's interesting what the Lord does. We're going to see this as we continue. Uh, verse 31. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Huh. Isn't that an interesting punishment? That God says, I'm going to take away, there won't be any old men in your house. Well, what's that mean? Let's continue. Verse 32. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth uh, which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age and this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas in one day they shall die both of them and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind 
and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. So what happens here is God says, because your family, because your house is sinning, there's not going to be any more old men in your house. Which means what? It means that they're not going to be able to benefit from the wisdom of the elderly. And basically, it says there that they're going to die in the flower of their age. I remember what we read earlier in Proverbs about the glory of young men is their strength. When a young man is in his late teens, early 20s, you know, he's, that's usually, you know, I guess you'd consider that the flower of his age. And the Lord says, every time somebody in your house hits that late teens, early 20s, I'm going to kill him. There's not going to be anybody that lives to an old age. So basically, your whole house is just going to be young people. And they're really not going to have any experience. They're really not going to understand anything. So they're not going to be able to work. They're not going to be able to make a lot of money. So guess what? They're going to be starving. And they're going to have to go to the priest and beg for bread. Not go and have plenty of money and say, hey, I need a loaf of bread. They're going to be there begging. It's an interesting curse that the Lord puts on the house of Eli. Very interesting. Now look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. This is an interesting verse here. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Did you know that when things get really bad, the word of God becomes very precious? Isn't that an interesting thing? And of course, there's a lot more you could say about that there, that you know there was no open vision. The Lord wasn't openly speaking to them many times. But the word of the Lord becomes very precious at a point in time like that. Just wanted to throw that verse in there. But now we're going to look over at chapter 4, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 15. And you're going to see here what happens. You know, a lot of times in your Old Testament... Is it 2 Samuel 4, 15? Yeah, 2 Samuel 4, 15. There is none. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to, are these all references? Yeah, okay. First yeah, First Samuel. <laughs> I was, yeah. I was in the habit of having a rough one following. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I wrote Second Samuel. Okay. Because you pulled a Jesse. Yeah. That's what you said. Uh, first Samuel. Excuse me. First Samuel chapter four verse fifteen. Now in the Old Testament, a lot of times you'll see there's kind of the storyline, and then God comes in and He pronounces judgment, and He kind of gives a little bit of instruction and in righteousness, and then He goes back to the story again. Okay. So you had there in First First Samuel chapter two. The Lord, basically speaking through his priest, says, I'm going to bring this destruction upon your house. And all the way through chapter 3, it's kind of described. Chapter 4, it takes up with the story again. What happens? So look at 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 15. It says here, Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Hmm, not a good thing. Verse 18, And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. So Eli dies when he hears that his two sons were killed, just like the Lord said was going to happen, and the ark of God from the tabernacle, you know, it's a very important thing, that was taken by these heathen people. You know, that was a bad thing. And just like the Bible said, God said there's not going to be any more old men in your home, in your house. And Eli was the man that was the old man, and he died at that point in time. Kind of an interesting thing there. Uh, continuing on here. Verse 19. And his daughter-in-law 
Phineas's wife was with child near to be delivered, and when she heard of the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. Kind of an interesting thing there, because the women in Israel, when they had a son, it was a very wonderful thing and they would rejoice but she didn't even care verse 21 and she named the child Ichabod saying the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and the and because of her father-in-law and her husband and she said the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken kind of an interesting thing here because you could basically call what America is becoming you could call it Ichabod because the glory of God is departing from America. Interesting thing. But uh, this nation that once used to reverence the Word of God, the King James Bible, they don't reverence it anymore. And many of these churches, as I made mention earlier, they used to reverence and respect the elderly, and now they're turning against them. And more and more you're seeing this thing where in media... And in popular culture, they're starting to disrespect the elderly. And I have here a perfect example of it. Uh, this is a from Parade Magazine. And it's a picture of a Norman Rockwell painting of like Thanksgiving or Christmas. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. But the grandfather's standing there and he has a suit and tie on. People used to dress up when they get together for holidays. It's kind of interesting. You look at pictures of the Depression and the people that were standing in the food line were dressed in good clothes. People don't do that anymore either. But uh, the grandmother there, you know, she's got a nice dress on and she has this big turkey. And it says, Ah, the good old days when there was all the time in the world to create picture-perfect holidays and when families could enjoy every meal together, not just the big holiday feasts. Sure isn't how things look today. Why not? You know, the good old days when they had all the time in the world. Don't we have modern conveniences today that give us more free time? <laughs> no. I don't think so. No. No? You know, oh, you can get on the Internet and you can get your work done much quicker. No, you can't. Half the time you spend on your computer is usually fixing your computer, trying to make it work right. Our modern technology is not making people smarter. It's doing the exact opposite. Okay, why is it that they had more time back then when they were supposed to be dumber than we are today? But anyhow, it says here at the top, if your holidays don't look like uh, Rockwell's, look inside. And then you got the, the modern, this is the way it is now, you know, thing. And, you know, it's the people watching TV. And instead of a turkey, you're eating hot dogs, you know, and other microwave food and fast food types of things. You know, and you get a little girl over here in a bathrobe talking on her cell phone. The father's there in his pajamas. Just got up out of bed, you know, probably at noon. And, uh, you know, to see what's going on. They're making fun of the elderly. They're cutting down the elderly. And a lot of these churches, it's incredible. I don't have the thing here with me, but there was one that showed uh, there's a church here locally, if you want to call it a church, Methodist, you know, Fellowship Center. <laughs> uh, but they actually put out an advertisement showing elderly people dressed in their Sunday best singing hymns. And it was black and white. And it says this that was then. And it says this is now. And it shows a bunch of immodestly dressed women and men and stuff like that. And, you know, they're all smiling. And, you know, oh, we don't do the traditional church thing anymore. And you go to these modern churches, they almost despise the elderly. It's just disgusting. And uh, I just want to say a couple of other things here. And that is that uh, the elderly, if you have them in your church, if you, if you know some elderly, they should be honored, first of all. They should be defended. Secondly, they're to be taken care of. The Bible talks about the care of widows there in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Are the modern churches doing that? No. Many times they're running off the elderly people. That's foolish. I mean, think about how foolish that is. The people who have the experience and you run them off and you don't listen to them. And what is the average modern church centered around? 
It's centered around youth ministry. Well, why don't we, we, why aren't we concerned with what the elderly people want? Oh no, you know, you gotta bring in the youth and, you know, we get, gotta put the rock music up so loud that it, you know, offends the elderly and they leave. The modern churches are not of God. The modern churches are very, very wicked. Okay? It's just disgusting. I'm gonna be doing a thing about that in the future on, uh, the coming in of Christ Church and how the thing of dishonoring the elderly is part of that. But we're going to turn to one more place here in in the Bible this morning. Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 1. And your minor prophets. Zechariah chapter 8. You know, one of the... I was a wood turner for a little while, and uh, one of my, well, I'm still technically a wood turner, <laughs> but one of my heroes, one of the guys I learned from the most, was an older man, he was actually fought in World War II, but it was a British man named Bert Marsh, and he made a statement which has stuck with me all these years, and he said, a master craftsman is not a man that never makes mistakes, a master craftsman is somebody who makes a lot of mistakes and learns from each one. Now, you can't do that until you are older. You can't achieve master craftsman status the first three years that you're working. It takes a long time. It's called hands-on experience. And back in the old days, what you had is you had craftsman guilds. If you wanted to go out and you wanted to build back two or three hundred years ago, you had to go to a guild and you had to, to become an apprentice. You had to go in and sweep the floor. And then eventually they would trust you with an, a tool and they'd start to teach you. The older men would teach the younger. And it was that way with any kind of a craft that you wanted to learn. Now, all it takes to be in business is if you have enough money to do the advertising. And a lot of these young men that are in, in business have no clue what they're doing. But they have the money for advertising. They have a shiny new truck. They have newspaper ads, TV ads, and whatever else, and they're very poor with the work that they do. See, we've gone away. We've departed from what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that the older men are to teach the younger men. And then the things which thou hast you know, heard of me and learned among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. See, the Bible should be passed down from the older to the younger, and then when they get older, then they pass it down to the next generation. It's passed down and passed down and passed down. A bishop is not supposed to be a novice. Right. And there, there are things that you can learn from studying books. Definitely. Sure. I'm all for book reading. But there are other things that you're just going to have to learn on the street. There are other things you're just going to have to have that hands-on experience. You know? And you're going to get some scars some battle scars, and that's good. Okay, I'm talking physical and spiritual, by the way, too. Amen. You know? I mean, it, it's just such a warped system that we have today that the elderly are put down and the youth who have no experience are lifted up in our churches. Not our churches, but the churches. Totally backwards from the way the Lord wants it. But we're going to conclude here. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1 through 8. We're going to see what the Lord's plans are for the elderly, for the future here. Okay, it says here, Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Okay, Zion there being uh, Israel, essentially. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Has that happened yet? No. When will it happen? It will happen at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, that people call the great tribulation. And then Jesus is going to set up his millennial kingdom. Now, is there going to be a place for the elderly in that millennial kingdom? Well, let's keep reading here. Verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. God has a place for the elderly. They're going to be there in the streets dwelling safely with the kids. You know, the Lord has that system set up already. You know, and it's going to be very, very rough for those Jewish people in that time of Jacob's trouble. But there will be a remnant saved. And the Lord doesn't say, you know, oh, it's, I just want to have youth ministry now. We're just going to have the youth in. And the older people, you know, I'll make a little retirement area for you. You know, just kind of ship you off to some home over there. And, you know, we'll just have some help, you know, kind of taking care of you. Uh-uh. He has them all living together. Okay? And dwelling together. And I can guarantee you the Lord's going to say, Hey, kid, you need to respect that older person there. They can tell you what it was like back before the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> you know, you have Jews that are alive today that are going to fulfill that scripture right there. That are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to see all the horrors of it. And you're going to have kids that are born in that time period. And they're both going to make it into the millennial kingdom. And that older person is going to have quite a bit of wisdom. They're going to tell you what it was like to live as a Jew in Israel before God started to deal with Israel again. They're going to tell you, yeah, you know, I used to be an Orthodox Jew. And and uh, I remember, you know, when this crazy thing happened, I found out later it was the rapture. And then these two guys showed up and I realized one's Moses, one's Elijah. And they started preaching Jesus Christ. And I read the New Testament for the first time. And they're going to have all those experiences. They're going to be an incredible gift to the people in that millennial kingdom. And right now as Christians, if you are in a church system someplace that does not honor the elderly, you need to run away from that building. You're not in a legitimate church. A legitimate church will honor the elderly. And if you're a Christian and there are elderly Christians around you that you can learn from, you need to respect them and you need to learn from them. They know a lot. You know, I have a grandmother who's 93, you know, and you're going to be 94 before real long. And it's interesting to me to hear her talk about the depression. You know why? It's not because she read books on it and she studied it, you know, in depth. She lived it. She knows about it. Okay. She's qualified to speak about it much more than I could be. Okay. I could read all the books out there and I still wouldn't have that hands on experience. Okay, it's you can learn a lot from the elderly. And I just wanted to do a message today on the elderly because they're really getting kicked around by this modern church system and that that makes me very mad to see this system. I personally know of churches where people have gone in with the rock music and the older people they kick the older people out. That's not a legitimate move of the Lord. That's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's inspired by an antichrist spirit. And you look at what Hitler did. He called the older people useless eaters and he went in and he exterminated them. That's what a Satanist does. A Satanist will go against the elderly. A Christian will uplift the elderly and learn from the elderly. And it's interesting too because one more thing I'll say. What happened there to the house of Eli? God said as a curse, he said, there won't be any old men in you. What happens when you have a quote-unquote house of God and there's no more older people in it? Is that a blessing or a curse? It's a curse. Bad thing. So respect the elderly. And if you are elderly, if you're listening to this message, and I know that there's some brethren and, and sisters that, that are elderly, you realize your responsibility is to be sober, to be grave, to be patient. You know, you need to act your age. <laughs> You know, that's a respectful thing. Very respectful thing. Don't be ashamed of your age, your old age, if you are older. It's a very respectful thing. So that's going to be it for today. Uh, I guess we'll close here with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for the elderly Christians out there. Uh, thank you for the, the faith of our fathers that 
that uh, we can look back and we can see our godly heritage that we've had in this nation. Uh, we still have freedom, Lord. We're not being dragged off to prison and to be tortured or burned at the stake. And we're, we have that freedom because of the Christians, the Christian heritage, the godly heritage that we have uh, that our, our fathers uh, fought for down through the years. And right now that, that faith of our fathers, the, the old time hymns, the old King James Bible, it's being attacked. And you have a lot of these young guys coming out of college that think that they know more than the elderly. They think they know more than the old time preachers. And they're coming out and they're just making shipwreck of the of the faith, Lord. And they're they're making Christianity out to be something that's that's ridiculed and mocked, and for good reason, Lord. And I just uh, I pray that those that would hear this message that they would return to the faith, that old time religion, and that they would realize that they need to be respectful to the elderly Christians and uh, just learn from them. And Lord, I just thank you for your word and for the fact that we do have a, a very godly heritage here in this country. And I know it's disappearing, but I pray that we would all fight for that faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly contend for it, as your word says. And I uh, just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.